This is CBC Vancouver News. How did this happen? Somebody screwed up big time. People upended by a BC hydroelectrical explosion are stunned the utility knew there was a problem years ago but failed to act. Plus, hours after reopening, a critical Vancouver Island highway has once again closed, this time due to high winds. And the call to learn more about the deadliest act of terrorism in Canada's history. We can't let these 331 innocent people's lives just be forgotten. And there was so much potential. As victims, loved ones mark 38 years since the Air India disaster. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Janella Hamilton. Dan is on assignment tonight. Some of the people upended by a BC hydroelectrical explosion that injured two say they want compensation. It comes after the utility admitted yesterday it had known about the dangers seven years ago but failed to act. As Leanne Young reports, victims say it's a breach of public trust. It was an explosion that rocked the downtown core. <laughs> A four-story fireball that took out almost half a block of Burrard at West Hastings Street, including one of John Neat's coffee shops. If anybody had been sitting on that patio, they would have been incinerated. Two people were injured that Friday night, and reminders linger four months later. The historic Marine building shrouded in scaffolding, covered in ash. Neat says it could have been far worse. To be the owner of a business that somebody might have been killed at is, uh, is a pretty awful thought, you know, so. Um. The explosion's cause? A leaking gasket in an underground BC hydroelectrical vault. Somebody screwed up big time. 2016, they knew this was a problem and it, it took seven years and an explosion for them to finally go, yes, it's a problem. BC Hydro has admitted fault. We should have caught this much earlier and we didn't. In its own assessment, it says it identified the electrical vaults as high risk in 2016, but failed to fix the equipment. In my more than 30 year career at BC Hydro, um, and in my time as president and CEO, I have never been as disappointed as I am today to share this news. The Premier is also disappointed. Uh, to have BC Hydro infrastructure fail in such a spectacular way that causes uh, risk to public safety is profoundly disturbing to me and I know it is to BC Hydro as well as the minister. EB says the energy minister is reviewing the third party report on the explosion. All 13 electrical vaults identified have since been decommissioned. Other related equipment is being examined and Hydro says it will work with victims on compensation. It's encouraging news for NEAT but still he's uncertain. You don't think about going home and turning on a light or worry about the hydro lines outside your house or any of those things, but, but I guess we always have to be weary. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. Relief was short-lived for residents on Vancouver Island. A few hours after reopening Highway 4, it is once again closed in both directions. Highway 4 partially reopened this afternoon with a single lane of traffic, but was closed again shortly after 8 o'clock this evening due to high winds. The Ministry of Transportation says the change in weather poses safety concerns for cranes suspending protective wet wire mesh to prevent debris from falling onto the road. The province says once the winds die down, it will require several hours to raise the cranes and mesh back into place. Drivers are being asked to check Drive BC for updates. As for fire behavior, BC Wildfire Service says the Cameron Bluffs fire remains under control. While there is no word yet on when Highway 4 will reopen to single-lane traffic, Emily Vance was in Port Alberni earlier today finding out how residents cut off by these highway closures are feeling and what more needs to be done. This road is clearly a lifeline for people out here on the West Coast. It's the only paved route that connects Tofino, Euclulet, here, Port Alberni, and a number of First Nations communities with the rest of Vancouver Island. We spoke to people affected by the closure about what they're hoping for when it comes to the road's reopening. 
So early on with the road closure, we were most worried about food coming through. Um, our kitchen here, we get supplies three times a week. So that was obviously like, we have an order coming in two days, what's going to happen? Things like clean linen or like rat bar rags and things like that. Um, just cleaning supplies, paper towel, toilet paper that comes from a different supplier that wasn't willing to take the detour. So we started to dwindle through kind of our stocks. What are you really hoping for when it comes to the reopening of the road? We hope that people um, don't completely abandon plans to come to the West Coast. I, I think the uncertainty has been what's been hard to live with. Are we going to get gas in Port Alberni? There was a night when we had absolutely no gas in town. I, I think on top of everybody's mind is we really need the federal provincial governments to step up and to embrace an alternative route out of the valley. And I think that's key because you know, like if we all had to you know, evacuate Port Alberni, going to the West Coast, they don't have the infrastructure to support us. So these are not questions that you like to think about, but you know, in this day and age of emergency, climate, you know, that sort of thing, then, you know, you have to think about these things. Emily Vance, CBC News, Port Alberni. Vancouver police are looking into a homicide on the east side of the city. Last night, a body was discovered on a vacant property near Renfrew and Broadway. And as Liam Britton reports, neighbors say it's not the first time they've had concerns. Here at the corner of Renfrew and 8th, police have been searching these vacant homes for the past couple of days. A body was called in by a member of the public Wednesday night. The investigation has been ongoing since then. The whole block is taped off just off Broadway. The crime scene is quite large. Uh, it is a big, uh, several vacant homes, I believe, in that neighborhood. So it does, it will take a substantial amount of time to comb through the property and, and gather evidence. A half dozen cruisers and a large police truck can be seen Friday afternoon. But details from police are few. No info about the dead person. Neighbors say there have been squatters coming and going for some time, with more and more police patrolling the area over the past few weeks. At the beginning, it was just kind of this or the next house that they were checking. And then it just escal escalated from there. One resident even told us they saw people with cars entering and exiting the vacant homes. Now, no arrests have been made here so far, and police might be here for the long haul. They say they're prepared to spend the entire weekend on scene looking for clues. Liam Britton, CBC News, Vancouver. It's been 38 years since the Air India Flight 182 bombing sent shockwaves around the world. Today, to mark the somber anniversary, friends and family members of loved ones who died came together to mourn and remember. Zara Premji reports. It was 1985 when a BC made bomb killed 329 people. About 280 of them Canadian, just over 80 were children under the age of 12. Another bomb killed two baggage handlers in Japan. Mourners, friends and family gathered to remember and grieve. It's a tough time. Every year he's, every, every year we're all like, you so, sort of forget about it and then June 23rd comes and it's like you're reliving and I didn't ever get to meet I would have loved to meet him I just I had a I just had a baby boy I would have loved to introduce him to his cousins to his aunt but it never happened Sequinder Kaur Uppal, Perminder Kaur Uppal and Kuldeep Singh Uppal. It's been 38 years since this tragedy, the worst mass murder and terrorist attack in Canadian history but those who were touched firsthand say it remains fresh. We are still hoping for the justice. Many say they want to see this day memorialized, so more conversations will happen. It should be taught in Canadian schools. This should be mandatory. Like asking for this is kind of a little bit ridiculous. It should have already been done that everybody needs to know what happened on June 23rd, 1985. Now, in the end, this is the 38th year of remembrance. Now, those family members who are here say they want to make sure by year 39, there's more of a discussion, there's more of an understanding of this tragic loss in Canadian history. Zara Premji, CBC News, Vancouver. Many parts of the province are expected to face drought conditions this summer. It's been a warm and dry spring and early summer. And while, while there's been some rain recently, the province says it hasn't been enough to overcome the shortfall. BC ranks drought levels out of five right now. The East Peace region, Fort Nelson and Finley areas are all level four, while the majority of other watersheds are between level two and three, including the South Coast and Vancouver Island. 
only northwestern BC is currently sitting at level zero. The province is now asking you to limit how much water you use, including outdoor watering and taking shorter showers. Businesses are also being asked to do their part. The BC Agricultural Council says it's concerning to see drought conditions so early in the growing season. That really uh, has a, a severe effect when it comes to agriculture producers, just because there's that uncertainty very early in the growing season as to whether or not you're going to be able to see things through to the end of the year, whether or not your, your livelihood is going to be uh, affected by these severe climate conditions. If drought conditions worsen, the BC government may says it may issue temporary water restrictions. The weather update is brought to you by Direct Buy Furnace installing the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. Well, Johanna, I was so surprised. Yet another scorcher of a day today. It was a good one though, right? Like, it was beautiful. Felt like the summer we needed before we uh, headed into a weekend, especially after a couple soggy ones. Let me show you how hot we got. This is just straight temperatures without the Humidex. 24 at YVR with the Humidex at YVR, right by the water, feeling like 27 with the Humidex. Pitt Meadows, 27 with the Humidex, feeling like the low 30s. We felt that heat across the east side of the island, especially Southern Gulf Islands, uh, feeling like the low 30s as well. And really today was the first day we felt that heat in the interior. Uh, that did come with some thunderstorms that are still fire firing up late this evening. Once again, it's the northeast that took the uh, brunt of the biggest storms. So we still may see some of those storms push severe limits and we're still, still watching for poor air quality up in the northeast as well. Another day of potential isolated thunderstorm activity as we head into Saturday. Watch as I get through Saturday afternoon. Cold front clips the northeast, uh, bringing some showers to the piece. We still need that for our fires, uh, but we're starting to lose the precip as this high pressure fights to get in. It's really taking its time to move in. The south coast has seen the uh, hot and dry weather associated with it, but you can see even through to early next week, still looking at some isolated thunderstorm activity through the southeast. So it's not a, a true high pressure where we get that uh, sun and uh, clear, we get the sun and the warm temperatures. But watch as I take you through the weekend afternoon highs, coming down a little bit for Saturday and Sunday. It's not until early next week we have to start to worry about those 30s in the interior. That is going to turn fire danger around very quickly. So nice to have a seasonal weekend for most. Uh, it's early next week. We'll start to get into the 24s for YVR. That usually means uh, 30s inland. And yes, that is when we'll see that fire danger flip. But Janella, what another uh, long, dry stretch ahead. Absolutely. Thank you so much for breaking all that down for us, Johanna. You're welcome. NHL teams will not wear special jerseys for pre-game warm-ups during theme nights next season. That decision comes after a handful of players refuse to wear rainbow-colored pride jerseys. As Yasmin Gandam reports, it has some advocates and fans very disappointed. If you think you're going to get the opportunity to see an NHL player wear a limited edition jersey like this one that's designed for the volley, think again. The artist behind the Diwali jersey says it was a career highlight. I had tears in my eyes the whole time I was watching the warm-up. Um, it just felt so special. And the back of the jerseys had the players' names in Hindi and Punjabi. That's huge. She says it's disheartening as both a South Asian and a member of the LGBTQ plus community. Typically, the NHL is full of mostly white, straight, cis players, right? Um, and... You know, the NHL could have easily stood behind. We want to make an inclusive environment. We want everybody to feel welcome. And by just shutting everything down, um, that's a huge blow to so many communities. As Nagra looks through old sketches of designs, she is glad representation existed, even just for one night. The color scheme I picked for the artwork was kind of like the twinkling lights you see in the evening, um, especially in India when, like, the stories I always heard from my parents was that they would light hundreds of these clay lamps. The theme nights will continue and the jerseys will still be created and sold, but the NHL's board of directors and commissioner decided they won't be worn by any players. Because that's just become um, more of a distraction from really the essence of 
what the purpose of these nights are. But some teams across the BC Hockey League will continue having their players sport themed jerseys. We're not the NHL. We don't have the reach that, that they do, but from our local community here in Coquitlam, to the Tri-Cities, to the Outer Broad the community, the British Columbia Hockey League, we're going to keep wearing these jerseys. We're going to keep celebrating these different causes and awarenesses and bringing inclusion to our sport that we all love so much. The Coquitlam Express will unveil their pride jerseys next year. We'll enact a change in our, in our future generation where they say, wow, you know, if, if my hero can do that, so can us. CBC reached out to the Canucks for comment, but it declined. Still, some like Nagra will continue the legacy, even if it's just in their own home. And I asked them for two uh, jerseys so I could pass one to each of my kids. Yasmin Gandim, CBC News, Vancouver. To provincial politics now, Vancouver Mount Pleasant has long been one of the NDP's most rock-solid ridings, but it's up for grabs in a by-election along with Langford Juan de Fuca. As Mira Baines reports, voters head to the polls tomorrow. This place felt like a torture chamber. Former MLA for Vancouver Mount Pleasant Melanie Mark made an emotional farewell speech in the B.C. legislature before resigning. Women get it worse from the opposition. Women in, in question period get it worse than men. That's the bottom line. Mark won the Vancouver Mount Pleasant riding by almost 67 percent. It's a very diverse riding that includes thriving and gentrifying neighborhoods near Main Street as well as the downtown east side. BC NDP candidate Joan Phillip, an Indigenous rights leader and climate activist, is hoping to take over from Mark. The, the main thing is I want to carry on the leg her legacy. Philip has lived in Penticton for decades, serving as lands manager, but says she grew up in the riding, hailing from the Tsleil-Waututh Nation. Well, I've worked all over this area and my people are from here. This political scientist says Vancouver Mount Pleasant is a safe NDP seat, as is Langford Juan de Fuca, but says there's something to be learned before next year's provincial election. Uh, though governments don't traditionally win by elections in BC, we would anticipate the NDP would hold on to these uh, these two ridings. But I do think we want to look down ballot to see what dynamics are are happening. Uh, and that might tell us something a little bit more about the political environment in the province more generally. BC Green Party candidate and emergency management expert Wendy Hako says people want change. Her party was second in the 2020 election, capturing 20 percent of the vote that they are worried about affordability and housing and the climate crisis and how, you know, things like the heat dome, how that impacted the neighbourhood here. And the BC United candidate Jackie Lee lives in Richmond but has long volunteered in the community. He's opposed to safe supply and concerned about crime, reflecting his party's views. Public safety. Uh, a lot of people tell me that they do not feel safe uh, even walking out of their, their house. There has been controversy in the race. BC Conservative candidate Karen Litzk is defending her views after being accused of transphobia. As gender ideology is increasingly being enacted as public policy, it is polls will open tomorrow from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Results are expected before 9 o'clock. Mira Baines, CBC News, Vancouver. Coming up next, a closer look into the underwater beauty of our beautiful province. We'll be right back. Thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. Some students from Regina Public Schools have signed up to spend their last few days of the school year in the woods. They've enrolled in an Indigenous-led learning program with Knowledge Keeper Gary Gott, who will be sharing traditional teachings about medicinal plants, speaking Cree and tanning hides. Uh, yeah, let's put those pins in first and then we'll... It's the end of school camping trip for about a dozen high school students from different Regina schools. They've come to Echo Valley Provincial Park to set up camp. So if you look around here, there's medicines all over, like uh, these ones with the big leaves here. And to learn from culture advisor Gary Gott. Is there something stuck? They're enrolled in a land-based program called Miskasuin Asik. The name that we went under is called Miskasuin Aski, and it's basically finding yourself or finding oneself on the land and finding a connection to the land and, and how you connect to it in your own way. 
and we educate these students on uh, what we know from the scientific perspective and also from the cultural and spiritual and cultural perspective. <laughs> As a knowledge keeper, Gott shares his traditional teachings, including how to study medicinal plants, speak Cree, and tan hides, as well as other basic survival skills. A lot of them have never been exposed to how to make a fire, uh, how to canoe up, uh, how to paddle a canoe, uh, basic life skills, uh, survival skills, building a Quincy. Uh, we do all season camping and all season uh, activities. We expose them all. You want to avoid that ledge of rocks. So the program is open to all students in grade 11 or 12 at Regina Public Schools. They have to apply to attend the classes and teaching. 17-year-old Leah Prosper attends Balfour Collegiate. She loved learning to tan hides. Our first time fleshing the hide, we were all very sore. Like our arms were, <laughs> like our arms were just sore in like places we've never worked before. And um, also when it came to like softening the hide too, that was very physical because we had to drain it. And draining it, it was like a whole process of us just like continuously wrapping it around this thing. 16-year-old Darius Matichuk also attends Balfour Collegiate. The grade 11 student is Cree and is finally learning his language. Building a connection to the land and like, like she said, learning the language. We're taking a Cree university credit right now and like we're learning like basic introductions like how to say your name. For example, it would be like, Tansai Darius Nitsi Gastan. We realized by the end of it all, a lot of them have kind of woken up something inside of them that uh, kind of reattaches their kind of their spirit to the land and it changes them in many ways. Campus Regina wants more teenagers to apply to the program. The high school students earn university level credits in indigenous studies and the Cree language. And they learn about themselves and the land. Louise Beagle, CBC News, Echo Valley Provincial Park. A diver with 17 years of experience exploring coral reefs all over the world says some of the best biodiversity he's seen is right off the coast of Vancouver Island. Now he works as a professional photographer filming the rich sea life of this underwater world. I started diving about 17 years ago. And then after my very first breath in the water, I put in my mind, okay, this is, this is something I want to do when I grow up. I've been doing this professionally now, diving, filming underwater for about 10 to 12 years. When it comes to filming the natural world, it's just so much out there that we have no idea what's going on. So that's the source of inspiration that I get every time I get in the water. You're really going to win and lose every dive you go to. Vancouver Island hit me as a huge surprise. I spent a third of my life diving in the tropics, and then I came here in 2019 for the first time. I jumped in the water. I never, ever expected to find so much diversity in such a cold water region in the world, from like kelp forests to incredible micro life, sponges, walls, drop-offs, and it's just incredible. It really boosted my inspiration because so many new things I had never seen before. After 4,000 hours spent on the water and get to see that new subject, it was really mind blowing to me. I was on, on the other side around Nuka and sometimes the six gear sharks would come around to just check it out. I went there, I shore dived with my gear, I went in the water and um, I didn't see any sharks. But um, it was one of the places that nobody told me how it would be like underwater. And I found this huge garden of anemones, the perfect pristine walls and rocks covered with light. That hit me like it's a huge surprise again. The ocean, it has it's such a mis mysterious and unknown place that people just take for granted not knowing what's happening out there. And we rely so much on the ocean for our everyday lives, not just for food sources, but for oxygen that we breathe. That's part of the reason why I'm here trying documenting this, to share it with the world, the importance, the beauty, and how fragile these ecosystems are these days. 
Here we have a beautiful shot of the sunset this evening from the Victoria Harbor. We'll be right back after this quick break. Well, folks, this is what the ancient art of winemaking has come to, boxes of wine. Now, before you go making a judgment, that great winemaking country of France, for one, has been successfully using this Tetra Brick package for wines for some time. Well, for one thing, the packaging is cheaper than bottles. This particular packaging concept is in the vicinity of 25-30% uh, cheaper than traditional forms of glass in terms of the packaging cost itself, the packaging materials. How does that translate into savings at the retail level? We uh, expect this particular concept to result in a 10 to 12 percent saving at the retail level to the consumer. And then there's the matter of convenience. First of all, they come in two sizes, the one liter size and this handy 250 milliliter size. That's about eight ounces. Well, there's no doubt about it. They've got it together as far as convenience is concerned. They'll tell you that the average attache case will hold six of these. Try that with a bottle. And in case you're a Butterfingers who can't hold on to things, this is also unbreakable. Now, in the interest of getting a better shot, we dropped this cask three times. But it did prove to be breakable. Oh! <laughs> well, you couldn't get three times out of a bottle of wine anyway, let me tell you. And for those who have a hard time mastering a corkscrew without putting a lot of cork in the glass, you only have to master a pair of scissors. This is how it works. You lift the flaps, cut along the dotted lines, they claim, and voila, ready to pour. Now, I don't want to sound like one of the forces of darkness trying to repress new and progressive ideas, but I do have a problem with this new packaging. Wine is a romantic drink. You take a bottle of wine over to your sweetheart when you go and visit. What are you going to do? Are you going to phone up and say, Hi, honey, I'm bringing over a couple of boxes of wine. Or what happens if you're in a restaurant and you want to have a drink? You turn and say, Garçon, can I have a box of that San Gabriel? It doesn't quite ring true, don't you think? Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. CBC Vancouver is the premier media partner of the 2023 Surrey Fusion Festival, July 22nd and 23rd. Visit the festive cultural pavilions, enjoy free live music and family activities. And the 13th annual Indian Summer Festival takes place July 6th to the 16th. The festival's powerful 10-event lineup speaks to the theme of interdependence. Tickets at indiansummerfest.ca. Well, just in time for summer, the humpbacks are back in the Salish Sea, and they brought some calves with them. It's an all-star lineup featuring, wait for it, Strike, Graze, and Pop-Tart. All three whale moms have returned to our waters with their own calves. The whales typically give birth in the winter months in warmer waters off Hawaii and Mexico. They then return here with their new calves to feed through the summer before returning south in the late fall. That is so cool to see. And that is your late news for this Friday. Thank you so much for watching. For news at any time, visit our website, cbc.ca slash bc.
have a great night.